My name is Malika Collette. I'm a member of For Our Grandchildren, um, and I am taking the spot of hosting tonight's event. Um, as usual, host Beth and Scott are away um, this week um, camping with family, um, but I'm excited to be here with you tonight. Now, before we begin today's event, we would like to respectfully acknowledge that we are situated on the ancestral lands and waters of the Anishinaabe Mississauga people, lands covered by the Williams Treaty and Treaty 20. It is vital that we uphold Indigenous knowledge and wisdom in this fight for climate justice, as Indigenous peoples are the stewards of this land and have been since time immemorial. May we honor their teaching and care for this land, especially in this fight. May we live respectfully in peace, friendship, and reconciliation with the original people. We are all treaty people. For those of you that may be joining us for our grandchildren event for the first time, for our grandchildren is a Peterborough Nodo Jiwanong based climate action group whose mission is to inspire, inform, and mobilize people to take effective action in response to the climate crisis. We want to empower people to be part of the solution. So if you aren't already, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram and check out our website for more ways to get involved. Um, and as, climate, as Canadian climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe says, one of the most important things we can do to address climate change is to talk about it. And that's exactly what we're doing tonight and with these meets. And we encourage you to continue doing so with your friends, family, and colleagues every day. With an increase in climate disasters and headlines comes an increase in climate or eco-anxiety. But the biggest and best thing you can do to address that eco-anxiety is to get involved and join others in this collective fight and know that there are so many others out there fighting with you. So if you're not already a member of For Our Grandchildren, I encourage you to consider doing so. And there's several different committees which you can get involved in once uh, part of the group, including political action, communication, and event planning. Um, and so the form to sign up if you are interested is on our website. Um, we'll make sure that the website is put in the chat throughout tonight's event. Um, and if you ever miss a past For Our Grandchildren meet, these events that happen monthly, they are all found on the website and YouTube if you want to go back and watch one or share one with others. Um, let's get to Jacob's presentation, which we're all here for. Um, Jacob Rodenberg is an award-winning educator, instructor at Trent University, and the executive director of Camp Kawartha, an outdoor environment center and camp. Jacob will introduce us to a suite of activities that practice using your sight, hearing, feeling, smell, and taste in new and creative ways to help you refresh your connection to nature. From following scent trails to creating micro trails, from drawing sound to creating beautiful nature sculptures. Jacob will draw from his new book published just this spring called The Book of Nature Connections, 70 Sensory Activities for All Ages. I'll now pass it over to Jacob and just remind everyone to stay muted throughout the event unless Jacob calls on us for this discussion. Um, so over to you, Jacob. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks, Malika. So nice to be with you all. I'm here on the coast of Maine, so I'm quite a ways away, but through the magic of technology, here I am. And um, what I'm going to do is share my screen. Can you see that okay? Great. Yep, that's good. And Malika's right. I may call on you to help me out with certain activities, so I'll invite you to unmute and we'll do some fun and creative things together. At least I hope we will. How many of you have ever had the joy of hearing a real wolf chorus howl. Anybody? It's haunting. I have. So I thought to start off with, wouldn't it be fun to recreate an actual wolf howl on Zoom? We can do it. Here's how it works. Well, wolves howl, scientists think, as a way to communicate with individual wolves, also as a way to stay in touch with other wolf packs to let them know that this is their territory. And a howl will start when the alpha wolf lifts up its tail then sits down on its haunches, tilts its muzzle towards the sky and lets loose with a And I'm gonna suggest that Guy can be our alpha wolf. Go ahead, Guy, let loose with a howl. Ow! Ow! I'm not sitting down on my haunches though, so. No, that's probably not beautiful. working. Ow! That's great. And then once that happens, the beta wolf, the second in charge, will duet. So their voices will intertwine. 
So Malika, I'm going to invite you to let loose with a howl. It's therapeutic. It feels good. So the two of you together, one, two, three. Ow! Nice. Okay, and that stimulates the other adult wolves to join in the chorus. So I'm going to invite you to unmute. Not all of you, because some of you need to be the puppies. And the puppies don't have fully developed vocal cords, and they sound more like this. So let's see if we can recreate this step by step. Picture yourself on the side of a lake. Star is sparkling. You hear a loon calling in the distance. And then the alpha wolf lets loose with a howl. Ow! And the beta wolf joins in. Ow! And the other adult wolves, we know who you are, join in too. Ow! 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 <laughs> Wonderful. We created a zoom wolf howl. Be proud of yourself. You made it work. Now, nature is replete with all kinds of wonderful sounds. And we'll have a chance later on to see if we can explore that world a little bit more. But first, so this. The average person spends something like eight to 10 hours a day in front of a glowing screen. And when that happens, really only two of their senses are activated, their sense of sight and their sense of hearing. The sight, everything's hermetically sealed in the screen. That's not very big. It's like looking at the rest of the world through a window. And sound, yes, they hear, but those other senses, the sense of smell and touch and taste, they're ignored. I wonder, and I'm just postulating here, could it be with all of our time in a technically saturated world, we are spending, we're disconnecting from the very life systems that nurture and sustain us, that we feel a sense of loneliness because we're not connected to something bigger and we yearn to belong to something bigger. And I think kids maybe feel that too. So time in nature has been shown to be remarkable. Just breathing in forest air. Next time you're outside and you're under a tree, take a deep breath because that air, forest air, boosts your immune system, boosts your killer T cells, and also elevates your serotonin level. That's the feel good hormone. Just being outside, even for a few minutes, you come back inside, you focus better, you're happier. It's been shown to stimulate creativity just playing in the schoolyard for a little bit. Simply seeing the color green makes you happier. But what I wanna do right now is think about sommeliers. A sommelier is someone who loves wine. I love wine. In fact, I have a bottle of wine right here. I don't know if you can see it, there it is. And I'm gonna pour myself a glass because what the heck, it's a long day. And there we go. But a sommelier gets to be good at wine because they activate all of their senses. They might take a deep whiff and the wine might smell nutty. They might take a little sip, let it roll over their tongue and say, it feels velvety. It tastes sumptuous. The color, goldeny. In fact, I looked it up and there's about a hundred different adjectives to describe the experience of using your senses to enjoy wine. I think we can learn from sommeliers. I think we can become nature sommeliers by activating all of our senses and literally drinking the natural world in. And in doing so, we feel more part of that wonderful life systems we're privileged to be with. Now, I'm gonna challenge you as a grandparent, as a parent, if you have kids, to go and find a special spot nearby your house and to go that spot often. You know, a famous researcher by the name of Thomas Tanner once asked a seminal question. He said, how is it that some people will give up their lives to protect a river? Or how is it that some people will give up their lives to conserve a chunk of land? What was it about their childhood that made them that way? Well, after interviewing people from around the world, in Africa, in Europe, in Canada, everywhere, the one experience that kids seemed to have that was held in common was they were outside while growing up. 
They had rich experiences in nature. Might have been they were walking to school. It might have been they were camping, whatever. But just realize today, if we're spending so much time indoors away from na nature, maybe there is that nature deficit disorder. So if you can find a special place and bring a child and even yourself there over and over again, you begin to build a relationship with it. And in building a relationship, you feel that beginning sense of connection. And in any relationship, it takes intention, mindfulness, hard work, but it's immensely fulfilling. When we build a relationship with nature, we build intimacy. So for example, there's a place that I go to right next to the river with a big oak tree. And up in the oak tree is this beautiful hole that reminds me of a heart. And in and out of that hole, I've seen squirrels. One time, some woodpeckers inhabited it. But I get to know the stories and the characters of that place. And my wife, Jessica, is really good about animating the landscape and imbuing it with character. Because I think in our culture, we tend to objectify nature. We think it's there simply for the human taking. So I invite you to get to know your neighborhood. That's part of your community too, your family. A little story, I had a good friend. He was a principal of a school. And one day he was walking and the kids said, hey, mister, what's that? Scurrying across the parking lot was this bird with a black and white band. He knew what kind of bird it was, but being a wise educator, he said, huh, why don't we look that up and see if we can figure it out? So he handed a field guide to the kids and binoculars and they figured out it was a killdeer. And then one of the sharp-eyed youngsters said, oh, but he's made a nest. Look, there's four speckled eggs. Well, it was in a parking lot. Once they knew that, they gathered up some pylons, some flagging tape, and they made sure to protect that spot so no cars would drive over. And over the next little while, those kids got to watch the killdeer. As it did its broken wing trick, you know, when a killdeer is disturbed, it'll pretend its wing is broken to lead predators away from the nest. Eventually, the eggs hatched out. Mama killdeer bravely fed them insects and the babies grew up and flew away. But by that time, there's no way those kids would have let anything happen to the killdeer because they had a relationship with it. They grew included as part of their family. Now, we have a climate crisis. And it's a tragic and terrible thing. But I think it's a symptom of a bigger problem. And the bigger problem is our broken relationship with nature. But if we can find the time to bring nature to the places we live, to introduce people to their family, which is the natural world, I think that will begin to heal and maybe, maybe turn things around so people will treat the natural world differently. Anishinaabe in our area used the word anakana suggest that we're in relation, um, that in kinship with all living things, even the rocks, the trees, the sky. It's a lovely way of looking at the natural world and maybe an ethic we can instill in our grandchildren. So if you can, in your magic spot, your special place, sit and just drink that place and recognize you are the only person in the whole world that occupies that space at that time. Breathe the air. What does it smell like? Can you taste moisture in the air? Listen, what sounds can you hear? You hear the creaking of branches, the squelching of leaves underfoot. Are you a sathuricist? Can you listen to the different sounds of the wind as it tosses the branches of the tree? Can you pick up some earth and feel in the ridges of your finger? Recognize in a handful of earth, there's more life than people on earth. Smell the earth, realize it too is replete with life. It's not dirt, it's soil and it's home to so many living things. Look around and notice all the sheens of color. So we're gonna go through some of our senses and just suggest some ways that you can enhance your sense of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. So you get to experience the natural world in a slightly different way. One thing I'm gonna do right now, if you can close one eye, close one eye, take your two hands and stretch your fingers out 
and try to touch your fingers with one eye closed. Can you do that? Touch the tips of your fingers together with your arms outstretched. It's tough because actually we have the eyes of a predator. We have stereoscopic vision. With, with our eyes placed in front of our head at slightly different angles, we see depth. Whereas a deer or a rabbit with its eyes on the side of the head sees more around. Our peripheral vision is limited. You can take your two fingers again and stretch them out and how wiggle them. And how far can you see your fingers off to the side while looking straight in front of you? Now, I don't know if I can ask you really quickly to go grab a leaf. Is there a leaf from a house plant you can grab? Can you step outside? I can give you at least a minute to do that. I got my leaf. It's a real leaf, I don't have to do that. Can you go get a leaf? It'll be worth it. Rosemary, can you send your grandchild to get a leaf? Awesome. Go get a leaf. Yeah, the wine is good. Jacob, comparing it to sommelier uh, was really effective. Okay, good. And I'm enjoying the wine. <laughs> All right. Hopefully we have a leaf. Okay, hold your leaf up just for the fun of it. Okay, nice, nice. Other people have a leaf. Malika is still running off and getting her leaf. Oh. You know that famous detective Sherlock Holmes? His sidekick Watson was always amazed that Sherlock could solve mysteries. And he'd ask one, um, Sherlock, Sherlock, how do you do it? And to which Sherlock would reply, my dear Watson, you see, but you do not notice. So it is in that vein hmm, that we're gonna look at our leaf and ask the following question. I'm going to say, well, not a question so much as I noticed that. I noticed that this leaf that I'm holding in my hand is pointy. I'm noticing that on one side, there are more pronounced veins than the other. I'm noticing that there are serrations or that the side is tooth. I'm noticing that a little tiny bit of it has been eaten by an insect. What do you notice? And you can just unmute and what do you notice? Anybody? This leaf is very waxy. Oh, okay, it's thick, right. Anybody else? What do you notice? Mine's it's wet. <laughs> Yours is wet, okay. Mine's not perfectly symmetrical. No, oh, an asymmetrical leaf, cool. Mine has prickles on the underside of the, the center. It's got prickles. Oh, interesting. I wonder what that's for. All right. Mine is dirt splotches. Oh, excellent. Now, Mine is Matt, fuzzy. Sorry, I missed that. Yours is? Fuzzy. Fuzzy, yes. Some are and, smooth, some are fuzzy. Yeah. And mine has different veins. Oh, nice. So thicker, thinner veins. Sometimes the veins run parallel. All right. Well, the next statement to make is, I wonder. So for example, I wonder why my leaf is shaped the way it is. I wonder why one side is a slightly different color than the other side. I wonder why the stem is not totally round. I, I wonder why it's jagged on the edges. What do you wonder? I wonder if it floats. It floats. Hey. Why one side is wider than the other. Yeah, neat. Anybody else have a wonder question or a wonder statement? Why is it a different color underneath? Yeah, good. The leaf. Yeah. I wonder why it's so small. I why it's so small. Yeah, why it's small. So the last statement I'd like you to consider is the following. It reminds me of this leaf reminds me that it's full and green now, but in a month or two, it's going to be a different color. So it reminds me that the seasons change more quickly. One of Drew's and mine's favorite quote is how early it begins to get late. 
when it comes to summer. Um, what does it remind you of your leaf? My leaf reminds me of the, the, the channels in a lung, the different. Oh, interesting. Thick at one end and then getting thinner towards the end. Yeah, yeah, the little alveoli or whatever they're called in the lungs. Cool. Yeah. And this sequence is a really nice thing to do with kids or even with yourself because first you start with observing. The next thing is you start asking wonder questions and realize for every question asked, there is an answer out there. Some science knows, some it doesn't. But those questions are so precious. And they are, of course, the beginning of something called the engine of learning, curiosity. Right? And if we can stimulate and encourage curiosity in children, we will have instilled a lifelong love of learning. And those wonder questions, you as a grandparent can ask them, and you can even ask yourself, just go for a walk. There's so many things to wonder about. I wonder what the heck is that ball of leaves doing in the tree? What is that? What made that? What made that huge hole in that tree? Well, there's an answer. Of course, the ball of leaves is a squirrel's dray. It's squirrels bunching leaves together in a framework of sticks. The holes were made by pileated woodpeckers. Can you imagine smashing your head against solid wood, and being able to excavate a hole? That's pretty impressive. And of course, woodpeckers have special adaptations to help them do that. And then the last of the sequence that I was talking about, it reminds me of, is all about building relationships between things and getting kids and yourself to recognize that the natural world is beautifully interconnected, beautifully interwoven. So when we go out into nature ourselves, be wary of the yuck factor. And I don't know how many times, and Drew, maybe you've had experienced this too, of, of kids or parents saying, oh, that's gross. Oh, that yuck, like this rat-tailed maggot. But realize the way you speak about nature is so important. You can either encourage love and connection, or you can shut things down. So even if you are uncomfortable, you can always say, oh, that's interesting, or how cool is that? That's neat. So make sure that you speak about the natural world in a positive and affirming way where you can. And sometimes just reframing things makes nature that much more appealing. Like what if I said, hey, do you want to catch an underwater jet propelled jaw thrusting bug snatcher and you're a kid? Oh, sure. Show me where one of those is found. And I would walk you to a pond and I would scoop a net in the ooze and out would come a baby dragonfly. They're jet propelled because baby dragonflies spend their first part of their life in the water. They suck water in through their mouth and they expel it out their rear end so they can surge forward. And they have this cool folding jaw called a labium. So they can grasp an insect and haul it back in again. So there you go, an underwater jet propelled jaw thrusting bug snatcher. And just using a bit of creative language, you could maybe find a, I can't quite see because the bar is there, insect gobbling wood slammer. That's a woodpecker. That's exactly what they do. They make holes in the wood so that they can eat insects. A wind soaring acorn gobbler, flying squirrel or green face, sweet smelling sun catcher, a cedar. You can make up cool names. I'm just trying to change the slide, which is, there you go. So when you go for a walk, we've been talking about vision, crammed in the back of your eyes are about 6 million cones and they can see different peg pigments, red, green, and blue. And you can distinguish over 1 million hues of color and in glorious 3D. A screen can't do that. You can do the old photographer's trick. Let's try it. One hand up like that, thumb down. The other hand going the other way with the thumb up. Boom, you've made a frame. Just simply by looking at the frame, you've isolated part of nature and you're seeing it in a new way. Glue some popsicle sticks together. You can create a frame, use some clothes pins, and you can frame up some cool things. Sometimes I, I run some rope from one end of a natural area to another, maybe 25 yards in length with some clothes pins, and we get kids to hang their frames along the rope where they have a beautiful view and give it a name. Or you can even put your frame on top of a wildflower on the ground. 
try the green sheen challenge. Drew and I have been talking about this. We wrote a book together called The Big Book of Nature Activities. But in the spring of the year, there are so many different shades of green. And we're not really aware of that until we tune our eyes in. So later on, I can share this, but there's some different shades of green. Can you go and find something in nature that exactly matches those shades? It's harder than you think. And in my book called The Book of Nature Connection, here, I have some seasonal color wheels. And same idea, every season has its own palette of colors. And can you closely match the colors that I have in the seasonal color wheels? I love talking about camouflage. You know, when light falls on an object, it tends to be darker on the bottom. Check out that cylinder, they're lighter on the top. Well, animals, they do the opposite. It's called counter shading, where they're darker on top and lighter on the bottom. The deer, for example, pretty well any animal, a mammal, has that kind of color variation, even a frog. So that's called counter shading. But there's also mimicry like the walking stick, or there is concealment coloration, like this owl hiding in the tree. One thing I love doing, you can try this too, is cutting out some pictures of native animals and then getting your grandchild to hide their eyes and then. You hide it in a camouflage spot and see if they can find it. That's my little chipmunk I hid. Very easy to do. Or I love doing this activity. I'll make nests with kids. Or we'll have some goopy mud. I, just soil mixed with warm water will make a nice mud. Warm means it's pleasant for the kids to put their hands in. Gather up some dried grass and you can make a pretty good looking nest if you just mush it all together and shape it with your fingers. Recognize birds make nests, but they don't have hands with opposable thumbs. They do with their beak and their feet. The robin might take 1800 trips. But birds that nest on the ground, like wild turkeys and killdeer and others, they have camouflaged eggs. And it's kind of fun to see if you can mimic that by laying down different colors like I've done on the bottom there and see if you can hide that and see if the kids can find it. So sometimes I'll say to kids, hey, do you wanna find an earth boring submarine or a baby dragon or a shapeshifter? And kids will say, sure. We go on a basement window hunt and in the forest, there's always a log, there's always a rock. And I explain very carefully gonna lift it up and we're gonna peek and see what's underneath. There, we might find salamanders. In fact, at Camp Kawartha, all kinds of redback salamanders. They kind of look like tiny dragons, don't they? Earth boring submarines, earthworms, right? They bore their way through the soil, aerating it, and their poo called castings end up making the soil more fertile. Shapeshifters, pill bugs that roll up from a long elongated shape to a, a round shape. Speaking about seeing nature, I'm inspired and I love the work of Andy Goldsworthy. Andy Goldsworthy is a sculptor that hails from Great Britain. His rule is he'll go into nature and only using his hands, he'll create a sculpture out of the natural found materials. He'll take a picture of it and he'll let nature reclaim it. So I find if I show kids some of these pictures, they begin to make the most incredible art. Here's some of Andy Goldsworthy's work. He loves to play with color. So at the base of the tree, you can see he found leaves that were deep yellow, and then he laid down slightly darker colors, or he breathes pieces of ice together, or he balances rocks. Here's one that our kids made, inspired by the work of Andy Goldsworthy. Now, I'm always careful because I know we're harvesting from nature. I don't believe that nature should be a museum where we don't touch it. If we want kids to love nature, they have to engage it, full-bodied engagement with all their senses. And yes, that might mean harvesting a little bit, 
And I'm mindful about where I do this in an area that can take it. And we only do a little bit from here and a little bit from there. And I talk about Robin Wall Kimmer and braiding sweetgrass. She mentions the word an honorable harvest. And really we should be taking a little bit and giving more than we take. So sometimes I'll have wildflower seeds that I'll sprinkle or we'll plant a tree later on, but some way of giving back and demonstrating reciprocity. Here's another sculpture that some kids made, just using sticks and leaves and patterns. I love making natural ink. You can do that easily. Gather up blueberries or raspberries. Boil it with a bit of vinegar in a pot. The vinegar acts as a mordant. Put it through a strainer and voila, you've got ink. I use feathers to draw or I use natural paint brushes. Pretty easy to do. You can use cedar, grasses, moss, whatever. Just tie it to a stick and you'll get all kinds of interesting textures. You know, I once took my kids when they were small on a glorious hike. My son was on my shoulders. My daughter was holding my hand. We got to the top, this beautiful rock, it was autumn, overlooking lakes sparkling in the sunlight. There were maples of red and gold. I was mesmerized by the view. And my kids were down looking at the ants at their feet. Turns out the kids tend to have a more contracted view of the environment. So harness it by creating micro trails. All you do there is you take some popsicle sticks and some yarn, and your rule is we're gonna create a trail, but it's not gonna be any longer than 10 meters. And any interesting stop along the way, let's say it's a hole in the ground, maybe it's a chewed leaf, maybe it's a fossil, maybe it's some moss. We're gonna stick the popsicle stick right next to it and then link it all by the yarn. And that creates a little micro trail. I give kids magnifying glasses. Another thing, we don't really get the impression that nature changes to our eyes. It looks kind of static, although, you know, we'll come back in a few days and might notice it. But to really notice change, try this idea. In the spring or the fall, take a clothespin and put your name on it or your child's name and clip it to a leaf. And then come back and see that one leaf every day. And notice in the autumn how it changes color and, and the sequence of color change. In the spring, clip it to a bud. Come back and notice how that bud unfurls into a beautiful leaf. It goes quickly. And you can see I did one here with a maple leaf. And I think that sequence took a couple of days. A Japanese viewing party. The Japanese love nature. It's a bit sad because there isn't tons of it there. It's a very urbanized culture. But especially in the springtime, they will take some plum brandy and they'll sit in front of the cherry blossoms and just watch them. Watch them unfurl, although watch an orchid unfurl. It's amazing how beautiful it is if we take the time just to watch, patiently watch. It could be a sunset. It could be maybe the clouds in the sky. And yeah, a little plum brandy doesn't hurt, or it could be apple juice. But taking the time to savor it and enjoy, like a sommelier. Yeah, the world is also full of sound. And how sad it is that when many of us walk in nature, we just see a smear of green, or we hear a wall of sound. But take the time to really hone in on the different sounds that are out there in nature, and you'll enjoy it so much more. One way you can do it is take your two hands and cup them together, put them behind your ears and push forward. Do that for me now, please. And you can hear 10 times better. What happens is sound vibrations hit your hand, go into your eardrum, eventually a series of interconnecting bones um, vibrate and cause the cochlea, the little hairs attached to a nerve impulse going to the brain. And we hear all kinds of sounds. We hear in three dimensions because we can pick up sounds from all different areas. You can try Jacob's handy dandy patented noise catchers, sound catchers. I just took some cardboard <laughs> and shaped them to my head and put some dowels, but you really can hear better that way. And yeah, I talked about sothericism, but 
Try this. Sit underneath a white pine and really listen to the sound the wind makes as it caresses the branches of the white pine. It's beautiful. It has its own unique sound. And there are some people that just by listening to the sound of the wind through the branches can get close to identifying the tree. Are you one of those people? Are you a sethericist? You can drive fingers up where with your child or you're by yourself and close your eyes, just listen. And every different natural sound, you flick up a finger and then you compare what you heard. I heard seven sounds. I think one was maybe a cardinal, another was um, the grass as it was being swept by the wind, another was splashing of water. What sounds did you hear? You can even create a bit of a sound map where a piece of paper, you say, oh, I heard a dog barking in the distance over here. You draw a dog in the direction you heard it. And that way, the sound translates onto paper. Hey, Drew is good at this. Actually, Drew is my mentor when it comes to bird whispering. Many of you probably know, but maybe not all of you do. But you can call birds in. If you make this sound, I invite you to do it right here, right now. Take your two lips and go, psh, psh, psh. give it a try. Psh, psh, psh. Yeah. That makes chickadees really curious and nuthatches and other birds too, even warblers. Stand very still beside a tree so you're not too obvious and pish. Be patient, it might take two, three, four minutes and chickadees will come. I've had as many as 60 chickadees almost within arm's reach. Scientists think it's kind of like an alarm call and the chickadees are coming in to check it out and, and maybe mob it as they do owls. Sometimes it's hard to remember those bird sounds. I don't have a good ear for this. Drew has an incredible ear as does Chris Risley and others. You can train your ear to be better by taking little sayings. It's called mnemonics. So for example, maybe you're familiar with the sound of the morning dove. Does that sound a bit like there's not? Or the cardinal. Gee, party, party, party. Doesn't matter. You can come up with your own little saying. Point is that if you remember the cadence, the rhythm, the tone, um, your walk through nature becomes that much more joyous. I went for an amazing walk this spring with both Chris and with Drew. Uh, he, uh, I, there are birds I never even knew that existed, and I learned some of their songs. Boy, what a beautiful world it is when you can hear birds singing. So we're going to try a little activity right here, right now. Um, I need you to unmute. And here are just some common bird species, and you'll see in the middle is the sound it actually makes. So what I want you to do is just pick, pick one, and, and right now just say it. One, two, three, go. So for example, it might be yellow warbler. Sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. Go ahead, just just pick one and, and say it. Sweetie, 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 and I want you to pay attention because when the time comes for your bird to sing, I want you to sing. So for example, if I said two in the morning, most of you wouldn't sing. But if I said six in the morning and you know it's, oh, my bird sings at that time, you sing. Does that make sense? Good. I'm gonna invite you to unmute. I'm gonna tell my story. So it's true. I'm an insomniac. I can't sleep. But one morning, really early, about three o'clock, I was tossing and turning. I decided I can't take it anymore. I grabbed my knapsack, I threw in my trusty flask of rum, a sandwich and a sweater, and off I went to my favorite spot, big old gnarled white pine on a drum roll. By that time, it was four o'clock in the morning and the stars were sparkling what over ahead. I knew it, it was five o'clock in the morning. The sun burst over the east 
horizon and began to flood the forest with light. And next, it was six o'clock in the morning. 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 Before I knew it, it was eight o'clock in the morning. Speedy. Some had heard talk most of the mist, and it was March. Speedy. Six o'clock in the morning. I stretched in another bite of sandwich. Speedy. Had a and before I knew it, it was 10 o'clock in the morning. Shadows were getting up. Uh, At 11 o'clock in the morning, I couldn't read the letter except for a red eyed vireo. At 12 o'clock noon, it's time for another sandwich, another slug of rum. And I watched the sun march towards the west. It was 1 o'clock in the afternoon, the shadows began to lengthen just a bit. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I stretched and laid down. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the sunlight began to Stretch a little bit more of the shadows. Four o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Five o'clock in the afternoon. Beautiful side light the photographer's love. At six o'clock in the evening, the sun began to march as well. At seven o'clock in the evening, it speedy over the western horizon. At eight o'clock, it flipped at that beautiful meeting of the day and the night called dusk. At nine o'clock in the evening, it passed. It was dark. At 10 o'clock in the evening, I heard the great horn owl. He said, Who's awake? Me too. <laughs> that time, I needed this. So I had another slug of rum. I went home, and nestled in my bed, and fell deep asleep. So there you go. Good for you. Did you hear the pulse of the forest? Did you see the pulse? In the morning, the birds sing more. In the afternoon, the birds sing more. But the quiet in the middle of the day. That's uh, yes. There you go. Anyway, well done. And you can learn your can frog just, songs too. Jacob, I'll just give you a quick time check at 747, just to leave oh a bit of time gosh. for questions. Okay. Uh, right. right. I'm not very good at managing time, am I? So All good. learn your frog calls. You can also listen to the heartbeat of a tree by taking, believe it or not, this works a stethoscope <laughs> in March, in the spring of the year when the sap is rising. You'll hear it bubble and pop and crackle as it rises. If you ever wondered, do trees give off moisture? Yes, they do. And take a plastic bag on a hot day, on a sunny day, tie it around a branch, a transparent bag, and come back in a couple of hours and you'll see it's full of water. So a mature tree can transpire 3,000 liters of water a day, moistens the air. And there's more here, but I need to get through a lot. I guess my point is, if you can talk to kids about a tree philosophy, that would be treeific. One thing is, just by virtue of being there, trees do more good than harm. You know, they uptake carbon, they give out oxygen, they aerate the soil, they moisten the air, they provide food. Wouldn't it be nice if every day we asked ourselves, can we give more than we take like a tree? Can we do more good than harm? And that really is my mantra for teaching children. We're trying to do a living building, which is modeled after a tree, so a tree can become more like a, a building can become more like a tree. Um, a little more, but so if you get a chance, go out, wet your upper lip, and as you do that, the moist air helps you to smell better. Well, you might not smell better, but you'll enhance your sense of smell. And by moistening your upper lip, just go and rub things, rub cedar, rub pine, rub bark, rub moss. They all have a distinct odor. It's beautiful. You can create little smell cocktails by gathering little bits of nature into a cup, having a swivel stick, stir it, and give it a name. It might be Petaltopia or Forest Licious. Follow scent trails by taking mint extract and drizzling a little bit along the way and seeing if kids can follow the trail. It's like a fox. If you ever watch a fox or a dog, they'll move their head back and forth, following a cone of scent until they isolate where the scent is coming from. Now, Tasting nature, if you can set up a little sensory garden uh, with different touches and different tastes. It might be anise, lemon balm, lovage mint, mullein, sage. I'm rushing because I realize I'm almost at the end here and I want some time for questions. So this is Jacob not managing his time well. There are other senses. Our sense of balance, proprioception. Um, let me just end. And I'm sorry for the abrupt ending and the rushing. This is a beautiful poem, and it is by Diane Ackerman. In the day, name of the daybreak and the eyelids of the morning and the wayfaring moon and the night when it departs, in the name of the sun and its mirrors, 
and the day that embraces it, and the cloud veil is gone <laughs> over it, and the outermost night, and the plants bursting with seed, and the crowning seasons of the firefly and the apple, I will honor all life, wherever and in whatever form it may dwell, on earth my home, and in the mansions of the stars. Feel free to contact me anytime. I love chatting with you. I love offering up suggestions. Um, there's the big book of nature activities you can purchase. This book, Book of Nature Connection, that just came out. And again, sorry for rushing, but hopefully you got something out of this presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was amazing. I think all of us will go away experiencing our time outside a little different. I think something that kind of sums it all up was what you said at the beginning, how nature is part of our community and part of our family, which I really love. Um, so thank you so much for all of that. Definitely a lot of amazing information and learned a lot. Um, so yeah, I'd love to open up for folks for discussion or questions um, now for Jacob. Um, and we'll start with one that I see from Rosemary in the chat. Um, Jacob, has this new US bill this week led to any encouragement for green people? referring to the climate bill that was passed yesterday by the Senate, I think. That's really hurting, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I, I can tell that the people that I'm living with are very happy um, that that happened. Wouldn't it be nice if I could, something like that could occur in Canada. Maybe we're moving in that direction. It's hard when the undercurrent seems to be uh, a rise of conservatism and climate change deniers. But at the same time, I was talking to um, the person who I live with is my mother-in-law, just or visiting. She said that in her block, almost every neighbor has rewilded part of their backyard. They've just let it grow in because they realize the value of bringing nature back. So that's hard to do. It is. Good. I found it so peaceful, Jacob. Um, and I can remember one of the best parts of my childhood was uh, making a frame out of uh, logs and then using moss to make pictures with the green for the bottom, you know, and the whiter moss for the, for the sky. <clears throat> and I wish I could have had the opportunity to do that with my grandchildren. I guess I, get, I have a question for you, actually. <laughs> sure. My grandson is really, he's three and a half, he's really interested in... in um, uh, looking at nature and bugs and I try not to say oh don't touch that one because it might sting you or whatever um, mm -hmm. he tends to uh, look at them so closely that he tears them apart and I think oh dear what do I say this <laughs> yeah what do you I mean, say I say we have to be really careful we don't want to hurt it yeah. and we put it in a little jar and we can look at it or I have these great magnifying boxes that make it really big and we can look at it and I say I I want to put it back to where it lives, right? If someone took you out of your home, wouldn't you want to go back to where you live? And w whatever we do, we're going to be gentle. We're not going to hurt anything. Yeah. And if, if you keep reminding kids over and over again, you'll instill that ethic of caring. That's great, thanks. Yeah, Rosemary is going to Do you have a question? Go ahead. I think if you stop your sharing, Jacob, of your screen, um, oh, sorry. We, can, uh, yes. we can see the rest of the people, what, who's asking for, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, um, so I just thought of, at the beginning of your presentation that it was really cool that you um, said, like, look around and sit in nature, because I do that for two weeks when I go to um, Camp Tanner Coon, and I feel like that would be my place to go when I, um, like, like to like sense all the stuff in nature. But what's your place? That was my question. Oh, my special place that I love to go to. I have more than one, but the special place that is right next to my house is along the river, and there's some beautiful old trees, so I can just nestle my back against the tree, watch the river float, listen to the birds. Um, and then where I work at Camp Kawartha, I have a few special, a big old cedar tree with many different branches, and I love mm -hmm. sitting in them and just looking up into the canopy and practicing sathuricism, listening to the wind as it brushes against the branches. But I'm glad. Keep going on your, your special place. That's wonderful. Anybody else, feel free to just unmute too if you have a question or you're welcome to put it in the chat as well and I can read it out. I'm just gonna say, I think we, 
just, you know, touching nature and trees. And I think we draw such energy from them too. I know yeah. I do anyway. Some people believe in earthing where you take your shoes mm -hmm. off and stick your feet in the soil and feel the yeah. energy rising out of the earth and feel strengthened by that. Yeah, for sure. I just love the idea, Jacob, of making up names like underground submarine earth mover yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. And I hope there's many examples for the non-creative types like me in your book. So. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there's a few. I'll, uh, Gee, I'm sure you can rise to the occasion. <laughs> you can do it. One of the more fun things that I've had with my grandson, by the way, Jake, but it's based on something you've told me one time, was just going out and there's about half a dozen different kinds of, of um, evergreen trees on our property and just taking him out and seeing if he can tell the difference by smelling them and remember. And then I'll bring back the, the things to him and just squeeze them a little bit on my fingers and let him smell them and he can. It's just amazing. Yeah, spruce smells different from hemlock, mm -hmm. smells different yeah. from pine, from cedar. Yeah. They're all lovely and yeah even just a, a gentle rub and sniff you'd yeah. be surprised at how many smells there are in the forest it's our most ancient sense it's attached to our amygdala our, our emotional center and so no wonder when we smell something we can be transported back in time um, yeah um, I, just... um, go ahead so i was just going to say uh, my daughter casey homeschooled her three young children during COVID with uh, your and Drew's book by her side with um, most days in the forest, even through the coldest days of the winter. And uh, was, uh, it, got, it got everyone through uh, COVID uh, with an enriched spirit, I think. Oh, so glad to hear that. That's great. Yeah, the healthiest place for people to be during COVID is outside. Yeah, I was just going to add one other thing. Uh, I just had the pleasure of spending a week at my uh, brother's cottage with three of my grandchildren. And we should never underestimate the old uh, staple of a nature activity, which is simply letting them catch stuff. They just had so much fun catching frogs. And you can do that right here in Peterborough at, in Jackson Park. The, the big pond there by the pagoda steaming with frogs and uh, so uh, yeah. that's a really easy one that kids i think have always and will always enjoy no end yeah it, it is wonderful you're right catching tadpoles too i am um, i look forward to to buying your your book jacob for our grandchildren i think i i was thoroughly mesmerized by your talk tonight and I think that they would find it so interesting so oh, um, I'm going to try some fun things with them when I when I get your book looking forward to it thank you so much mm. thank you my, yeah, grandson, my grandsons love fishing and um, they uh, come to right this lake and then they catch little fish and then we have the big problem of frying the hook out of uh, the mouth yeah. of the fish and yeah. the the fish is suffering i am suffering some yeah. of the kids are suffering um how how do we solve this problem well you can cut the barbs away from the fish hook have you done that you notice that the fish hook has a little barb on the end yes yes and that that'll make it easier okay. to remove the hook and yeah it's it is a tough one because you want kids to experience fish and the joy of catching fish but being careful not to hurt them. Exactly, yeah. And yet at the same time, we do eat food and the food comes from fish and animals, depending on your diet. Yeah. So, but yeah, you, you want to minimize suffering is what you're saying. Yeah. But try cutting away the barbs. Okay, thank you. So I'll just well, say it is has reached the hour, so for those that need to leave, um, thank you again so much for joining us. Um, and if you folks want to stay on for further discussion, you're welcome to as well. Um, but just realize people have other things going on. So yeah, thank you for those that need to leave. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you again for Jacob for joining us tonight. My great pleasure. Now, 
Go get your vitamin N, your vitamin nature. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Jacob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.